We're going to be in Hebrews chapter 2. I, I hope that uh, you got the journal sitting on the table outside. Uh, if you didn't, just grab one. There are also a few here on the front pew. Uh, I don't know why I call them pew. The front chair, all right? The front row. Uh, you can grab those if you want to. Uh, the thought is that it will be really helpful for you uh, just to stay focused and then the, the ability to write down some notes. Some things are going to pop out. I kind of warned you, Hebrews is extremely dense when it comes to theology, all right? As in last week, we had a whole sermon of just a couple of verses. Then we skipped a couple of verses. Today, a whole sermon out of only four verses. It's going to take us a while to get through chapter two because you get, it just gets really dense and it's rich and we don't want to miss any of that. So you have the ability to, to kind of keep notes and keep up with things. Um, I think the journal can be very helpful for you. So just remind you that that's what it's there for. I want us to read the first couple of verses of Hebrews uh, chapter two. We're going to focus on verses 1 through 4. Let me get my page right. And um, everybody there? All right, so Hebrews chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to His will. I hope that you uh, maybe have trained enough to notice that when we start with the word therefore, that means there's something going on here. And I don't know about you, like this happens to me at work an awful lot, where I'll walk into the ready room or something, I'll walk up a bunch of guys, and they're having a conversation, and you know, you walk into the middle of a conversation and you're just kind of lost, right? Now at work, I'm lost most of the time because they're usually talking about aviation and all kinds of weird stuff that I don't understand, right? I'm just, that's kind of my life. But it's worse when it's the middle of a conversation. And I kind of feel like that's what happens here. And the therefore should be your sign. Like obviously our, our author, and remember we paint, we paint this idea, the Hebrews in reality is a sermon. It's a sermon written by a Greek-educated Jewish man, well, we assume a man, Jewish person, to a mostly Jewish congregation, probably in Rome in some way, that's kind of struggling. And, and that's all it is. It's a really long-winded sermon. And what we've done is we've now caught him on the backside of his introduction, and he gets to start making his first point. And that's what this is. This is our author's, this sermon's first like preaching moment and his first point. And the point would be this, if you were to try to step back and like use a, you know, an outline of the sermon that you're reading right now, it's, it would be a call to commitment. He, he's, he's introduced, he said some things, and now he's like drawing, all right, here's what I'm telling you. And he calls his congregation to commitment, to responsibility, to really more of a reminder of accountability, that you are accountable to God and to, to ad address that, to accept it, to be mindful of it. And the therefore is the, the key phrase to start that off, that he's connecting like on something that has come before. So think about what we talked about last week or scan back and read chapter one real quick and what his introduction said, that since Jesus is so supremely awesome, right? Like that's my modern translation of chapter one. Jesus is so supremely awesome, better than the angels, all these things. You'd better zero in on what this message is that comes through Jesus. Like whatever it is that God, he'd reveal it a little bit, right, through the prophets, and then he reveals the fullness of it through Jesus, through his son. Whatever that message is, that you, you probably should zero in on it because he was that important and is that awesome. Now, presumably, because we see it kind of hinted in this first point, some of our author's audience is what he would call drifting. Meaning they're, they're, something's happening in their life, and probably just natural, because I think some of this is natural drifting. They're, they're allowing contemporary currents to push them or to pull them or to tug them away from basic Christian orthodoxy. Meaning, like we know this is what it means to be Christian, but something's happening either in Rome or maybe in a synagogue that's sitting right next door, and they're like, hey, no, if you really want to follow God, it's supposed to look like this. Oh, no, if you really want to be a Christian, it's supposed to look like this. And they're drifting. They're being pulled left or right or in different directions. And I, I know that we have no concept of that, right? Like we have no way of relating to the idea of being pulled in different ways by the world. But that's obviously what was happening to this congregation. So he looks at his people 
And he's told them, hey, Jesus is awesome. He's the full revelation of who God is and what God wants us to know. And now he says, you should pay attention to that because I know that you're struggling. I know that you're getting distracted. I know that you're hearing this and seeing that and your, your definition of what it means to be a Christ follower is kind of being conflicted. And he calls it drift. And then he tries to fix it. And he tries to fix it in two ways. Through the carrot and through the stick. Now you understand that uh, concept, right? Like if you want somebody to go and you, you put the carrot out in front of them like the donkey and they keep trying to eat it, it totally works. I love that idea, right? You can do it to a kid with a cookie. It's brilliant. You just kind of hold it out in front of them. They'll just follow you kind of wherever you go. Or you can get the stick behind them, right? And pop them in the tail. Either way, the same result. And that's kind of what our... Our author does with this part of his sermon is he throws the carrot out in front of us, this encouragement to pay more attention to Jesus, stay grounded in Christian faith, stay grounded in orthodoxy, and then he's going to follow it up with the stick, which is basically a warning, a warning about punishment. Punishment for neglect, punishment for drifting from the faith. And we're going to kind of use that as our basic outline to understand what he's saying. So we'll start with the carrot, all right? And he, he, it starts with that word, therefore. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard. So remember who Jesus is. Remember how awesome he is. He is better than the angels. He's the exact imprint of God. He's the full revelation of the word or the message of God. He is literally God. God's power and his presence made visible among us. That's everything that we talked about last week. That's the introduction of his sermon. So remembering that, you probably should pay much closer attention to what God has spoken. As a matter of fact, he says it, pay much closer attention to what we have heard. And this is where the, the idea of stepping into the middle of the conversation gets confusing. You're like, well, what do you mean what we have heard? So I'm helping you summarize it. What it is we have heard is the message through Jesus. It came through the prophets a little bit, and then it comes through Jesus fully revealed. And that's what he's saying is, if Jesus is who he's claimed to be and who we believe him to be, he is the fullness of the revelation of God, and that's where you should pay attention. That's where you should pay extra most attention. Why? Well, obviously he says it because Jesus is awesome. But then he, he follows it up on an idea about how reliable this message is. From Jesus is. And this is maybe pretty important. I keep having this conversation with a friend of mine at work about um, apologetics. Like he's really into apologetics and the defending of the faith. And I'm kind of like, whatever, that's your thing. And I, that's not my thing. But here we see an apologetics argument being made. As he says that if we, it, at the end of verse three, that this message, this revelation, right, of who God is, God's word was declared at first by the Lord, and then it was attested to, to us by those who heard, while God also bore witnesses by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. And what he's saying is, it's like this word that you have heard, this message that you hear, it's actually pretty reliable because it was declared at first by the Son, all right? And if he is the Son, we probably should pay attention to what he says because he is the Son of God and he is God himself. So it was declared by him, but then it was attested to us by eyewitnesses. And that's kind of important and a hinge point for our faith because I don't know about some of you, but I'm a young person. I wasn't there. I wasn't there. I didn't see it. All I have is eyewitness accounts. Declared by the Son, attested by eyewitnesses. And then he tacks on this idea of it was also attested to us by signs and by miracles. Miracles happening in that time? Absolutely, yeah. That's one of the ways that we can kind of confirm that Jesus is who he said he was. Is We look at how, how he lived, how he behaved. But also the possibility that signs and miracles happen in our time. That some form of sign or miracle or an act of the Holy Spirit, and that could just be a little tug on your heartstrings. I don't know. That can be defined in lots of ways, but that something is there to attest to you, hey, these eyewitnesses are onto something because they're attesting to something that was spoken by God himself. There's a cool note here, by the way. This is for those of you that are really nerding out like me. Like you can see the way he says this. It says in verse 3, it was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard. Do you notice how the author includes himself in that moment? 
that whatever this message is and how awesome it is was attested not to you, but to us. He includes himself with the third generation of Christians. So obviously not Jesus, obviously then also not the eyewitnesses. He is the third generation who get the word of the eyewitnesses, which means the author of this book can't be Paul because Paul considered himself an eyewitness, didn't he? He calls himself an apostle. He met Jesus on the road to Emmaus. He is an apostle, a first eyewitness to the life and the works and the miracles of Jesus. And this author isn't. Just a cool little note there for why we question the authorship of this book. I think about what he says. Based on who Jesus is and this thing that you've heard, pay much closer attention. And I'm going to be honest, like I hear that, to me it, it sounds like a, well you should just work harder kind of preaching. Right? Like the, basically he's standing up here and he looks at you and you're like, alright, I've had a rough day and I've worked 80 hours this week or whatever and, and then the preacher points at, well you should just try harder. You should just work harder. And that's bad preaching. Alright? It is. It's terrible preaching. It's definitely not like saved and scripture worthy of preaching. So I don't think that's what's happening. And that when I first read it, and this is one of the reasons I've, I've, I wrestle and I struggle with this passage, because it sounds like he's just like, well, just do better, right? You don't, don't just pay attention, pay better attention. I'm like, okay, I don't know what that means. And I think there's more to it than that. Because this isn't bad preaching. What, he, what he's doing is he's, he's addressing a natural tendency that exists in me. And he's addressing what I'm assuming is a natural tendency that exists in you. This tendency to drift. Do you notice this is what he says? You must pay closer attention to what we've heard, unless or lest we drift away from it. He knows that we have a tendency to wander. He knows that we have a tendency to drift. He knows that we have a tendency to, to, to not, I'm not intentionally ignoring the word of Jesus, right? I'm not, I'm not saying I want to understand something better. It's just I'm looking over here when I should be looking over there and I get distracted. And I drift. I move aside. I think about this like in the, the metaphor of, of a car. Supposed to drive, right? Ten and two. Actually, I think it's now like nine and three or something. You know, they've changed that number, but you're supposed to have your hands on the wheel, right? What happens if you let go? What happens if you let go? Your car is going to eventually, right, start to shift, right? Start to drift. It's going to drift either on the side that's on the right side, or it's going to drift onto the oh, the cars on the other side, and that's going to be bad for you. But like that's what it is. Like if you let go of the wheel of a car, it will eventually, very naturally, it will just start to drift. But what happens if you have ignored your maintenance? You hadn't rotated your tires in two years, and you let go of your wheel. You're in the ditch, right? It's not going to slowly drift. It's going to yank itself into somebody's traffic or somebody's mailbox or whatever it is, right? Like it's just going to go over to another place. And I think that's actually an incredibly good like illustration of way to think about what happens. Uh, what our author is trying to tell us here is that to stay focused or to pay more close attention, the idea is like you got to keep your hands here. But you also have got to make sure that you keep your tires rotated and aligned and, and balanced. And what he's telling us is you have to stay focused on, and then you also have to come back regularly to the revelation of God, of who God is, and the holiness of who God is that is presented to us through Jesus. And just follow the, follow the, the illustration with me for a second. You got your hands on the wheel. That's me staying connected to Jesus. I'm right there. I'm there with it. I'm connected. I'm staying in my lane. That's me being gospel focused. That's me being Jesus centered. It means that part of my day, at least at least parts of my day, are somehow thinking about, focused on, dwelling on who Jesus is as the full revelation of God and what holiness and righteousness is supposed to look like. That's just hands on the wheel. That's daily, all the time. But about every four, five, six months, right? I need to park the car and I need to have the tires aligned. I need to have them rotated and get the weights done again. That's me coming back to an occasional like deep dive into the gospel. 
an occasional deep dive into the person of who Jesus is to correct problems that have come up, to repair road damage, because I'm out here living and things happen and I have conversations and I do get distracted. And although my hands are on the wheel, like I'm just, I'm pulling different ways because life happens. And every now and then I've got to come back into the shop. We would call that church, right? And get realigned. Get myself refocused on what we would call the, the very basics. And I think if you just let me like play out this metaphor a little bit farther, that if you stay aligned, if you regularly like refocus on the gospel, meaning that let's just say every six weeks, let's just pick that number out of the air. I'm going to go back to who Jesus is. I'm going to go read through the book of John or the book of Mark. And I'm going to focus on not ethics and not all this how I should do things because those are cool and they're super important. But I'm going to go back to who Christ is. It's the full revelation of God and the supremacy of all things and worthy of all worship and showing me what righteousness and holiness is and rereading his sermon on the mount in Matthew 5 through 7 that shows me how I'm supposed to live. I'm going to look at Jesus Jesus. And if every now and then, just every couple of weeks, I'll come back and realign with that. When I'm back to driving, when I go back to work or school or whatever it is on Monday, I can occasionally take a hand off the wheel, can I? I can change the radio. I can have a drink. I can do something with this other hand every now and then because my tires are aligned. I don't have to hold it so tight because it's trying to go in the ditch the whole time. If you stay connected, if you come back and get realigned with Christ, it helps you stay on the road. It helps you avoid the dangers of, of drift. But if you don't, if you don't stay aligned, you're going to struggle to stay on the road. And even if you stay on the road, what happens? Your wheels end up crooked, right? You've seen a car go by, right, where the tires are just slightly crooked because they hadn't bothered to align them in three years, and you're literally driving sideways. <laughs> and eventually, you're going to take your hands off the wheel. You're going to have an itch. You're going to get thirsty. Some stupid song's going to come on and be like, I just can't. And you take your hands off, and now you're in the ditch. And you did that. You did it to yourself by not aligning your tires, by not coming back to basics. And we think about what that means then, like in our, let our metaphor go, come back to our spiritual idea, is that that means that you've allowed your definition of what it means to be Christian. You've allowed your definition of what it means to, I call myself a follower of Jesus, but I haven't looked at Jesus in six months. I haven't thought about Jesus in six months. I've never come back and realigned myself to who Jesus is. And what's happened is your definition of what it means to be Christian has evolved. It has shifted or changed in some way, or he uses the word, it has drifted in a way that now is being impacted by some other contemporary thing. Something that you're hearing from culture or from the news or from somebody else that you probably shouldn't be listening to, right? That your definition of what it means to be a Christ follower has been redefined because you've never come back to basic. You've never come back to base and gotten realigned. And this revelation of God, this message of salvation that's affirmed to you and attested to you by miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit, that message that he's defining here, you got to come back to it and realign with it because that revelation of who God is made through Jesus is what I would call like your stabilizing factor. It is the thing that stabilizes you. Like, I... I don't know about you, my life's a little hectic, right? I got all this stuff going on. I got a freaking senior, right? And my other kid's in middle school. And of course I'm married. And we all know how hectic that can be, right? Life, I need something that stabilizes me. I need something to keep my feet on the ground. I need a reason to get up in the morning. I need a reason to go to bed. I need something to care about. And that's who Jesus is. That's what the gospel is, is that stabilizing factor. 
I learned something cool this week. I dare you go home this afternoon and, and just just go into the rabbit hole of this. Just Google stabilizing factor. What it's going to do is you're going to find some form of, of like journal, a medical journal talking about factor 13, right? And it's actually pretty cool. Factor 13 is a state that it's literally like a fibrin stabilizing factor that's part of your blood. So it's, you know, when they break down your blood, blood, and I don't know however they do that, part of that, it was discovered in 1944, is this factor 13 that exists as part of your blood, and they call it the stabilizing factor because it's the part of your blood that helps allow your blood to, to clot, right? To coagulate. And that's that's what it does. It, it helps coagulate your blood so that it can clot. And it's designed to help like with, you know, if you get cut. It's part of the blood that allows you to survive an injury. So you think about what this factor 13 does, what this stabilizing factor does, is it literally holds the blood platelets together. Your blood's doing this, and if you cut your arm, it's all trying to do that at the same time. And factor 13 starts grabbing it all, then pulling it back together. It knots it all together so that it stops bleeding. And after a day or so, factor 13 releases, and it starts to heal. It works in three different ways. This factor 13, well, it, it helps in three different things. That's a better way of saying that. One, it helps with wound healing, right? So it allows a, a wound to stop bleeding and then heal and scab over and eventually get better. It also, like, we've been able to trace this, it helps in the formation of new blood vessels, right? So if you grow a different part of your body or something, you know, your belly gets bigger like mine has, well, there, it needs blood. Blood's got to get there, so new blood vessels need to be formed. Or say you've responded to some form of trauma and your blood vessels need to regrow, like factor 13 helps with the, the creation of blood vessels within your body. Factor 13 apparently also has a, 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 a big role to play with the interaction between an embryo and the uterus. Between the connection between mom and child, that interaction, the transmission of, of food and blood and life between the mother and the child, factor 13 is apparently part of the defining element of the blood that makes that happen. Now, I love this because this metaphor just jumps off the page to you, right? That factor 13 is part of the blood. It's the stabilizing factor of your blood that is necessary for the salvation of life through wound care and the creation of life through that interaction with the embryo. How fascinating is that? And we think about then that Jesus and a focus on Jesus, a paying attention just a little bit extra to the very basics of who Jesus is and how he reveals God to us, that that is the stabilizing factor in a naturally volatile life. We are vol we everything is happening and it's scary and it's terrifying and I'm so distracted. There's so many things happening in my life. And but Jesus is the calm. The basics of who Jesus is, is the stabilizing factor that grounds me. And without a consistent dose of Jesus, without a consistent and recurring dose of this full revelation of God, we, we become easily swayed by whatever else we hear that may sound Christian. Yeah, that sounds really Christian-like. All right, I'm going with that. And if we don't test it back to the revelation that God has given us, we drift. Our definition changes. And now we're wrong. So the care that he lays out in front of us is to, hey, pay attention and stay focused on what he calls this, like this message of salvation, the great salvation. Or we would take that back to chapter 1, to the full revelation of who God is revealed to you through Jesus. You stay focused on that and allow Jesus to ground you, to stabilize you, to keep you square. But then he comes with the stick. If the encouragement is not good enough, some of us need the stick. That's kind of how we were growing up. Encouragement was good enough for me, you know. All mom had to do was threaten to spank me, and that was enough. Dan, they had to beat him daylight. Beat him, just beat him to death, right? Katie, she was the daughter. Nobody cared. But, like, we're all a little different. So if, if the carrot doesn't work for you, let, let me bring to you the, the stick. And the stick is this, is that you're accountable to God for your actions. 
Now, you don't like to hear that. And this isn't part of the good news part that we like push out and make everybody want to come to church with. And yet it's part of what it means to, to read the gospel. You're accountable to God for your actions. Look at the way he says it. So in verse 2. Since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution. You see what he says? Like he's talking about the, the word that came through the angels. That's him rewording the idea of the word that came through the prophets. And there's history there, and we don't worry about that, but he's referencing in the Old Testament, right? He's talking about in the Old Testament, every word that you heard came with a, a retribution. So if you disobeyed this, you got this. If you did this, you got that. And go back and read the Old Testament all. That makes sense. You have to do this, and if you don't do it, then this is going to happen to you. Everything that we're supposed to do and every disobedience of what we're supposed to do came with an a, uh, like a created or connected or equated reaction. You're going to be punished because of doing this. All right? Now, he uses in this moment what we would call like a rabbinic preaching technique. And what he's doing, he's arguing from the lesser to the greater. And the, the basic idea is that if this is true, then surely this is true. Right? Like that's kind of what happens. So if the message through the prophets, think last week, if the message through the prophets is great, well then the message that comes to the Son has to be greater. Right? Well, then apply that same thing to what we're about to see is that if disobeying the message that comes to the prophets means that you're going to get punished, what happens if you disobey the message that came through the Son? Wouldn't it be greater? Read it again. Since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution... How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? There's a punishment. There's a consequence. There's a stick on the backside of this for neglecting the Son's message. If you neglect Jesus, if you neglect this message of salvation, Something bad happens. And I'm going to be honest with you, for, for us Baptists, like we struggle with this. Like we actually have a problem here because foundational concept of Baptist, right, is once saved, what? There we go. There are some Baptists in the room. I love it. Yeah. Once saved, always saved. Like that's something that we hold tight to. We talk about it all the time. All right. Jesus won't lose me. You can't pull me from the hand of Jesus. Once I'm always, once I'm saved, I'm always saved, right? This seems to conflict with that. It's like, oh my gosh, I, that's what I've always been taught. Was, I learned that in kindergarten, once saved, always saved. But now you're saying, if I neglect the, the teachings of Jesus, something bad's going to happen to me? I thought once I was saved, I, what? Let me show you a couple things that happen in Scripture. In John chapter 10, Jesus is talking, and he's talking about how we are, you know, the sheep, and he is the shepherd. And, and, and this is where the concept of once saved, always saved comes from. Is he, he quotes here, he says, and no one can snatch them from my hand. All right, that's John chapter 10, I think like verse 30. That's one of the places where we get the, that idea, is that Jesus says, look, you're my sheep, and I've got you in my hand. And once you're there, nothing can snatch it from you. I want you to turn with me to Romans. We're going, to just, we're going to catch a couple of pieces. So in Romans chapter 8, and I want you to keep your finger in Romans, right? Because we're going to look at another one there in a minute. But in Romans chapter 8, we see another great text that talks about like the, the perseverance of the saints. That's the fancy way of saying once saved, always saved. But in Romans chapter 8, we're going to pick up in verse 38. Now, let's pick up in verse 37. We'll see the whole context. He says, in all these things, this is Romans 8, 37. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Verse 38. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depths, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. What does he say? Literally, it says, nothing can separate us, right? Once we're there, can't pull me away. Nothing can separate us from the hand of God, all right? Don't lose that. Keep your finger there because we hear in Hebrews that if I neglect Jesus, then there's consequence. Now, he doesn't define it, but he is, he is going to pick it up later in chapter 10. In Hebrews chapter 10, it's verses 28 to 31, he talks about being trampling over the Word of God, of profaning the Word of God, of being outraged about who Christ is. And I have to wonder if that's what he means in chapter 2. 
about neglect. And then we compare how that connects to other passages in Scripture, like the words of Jesus in Matthew 25, verses 41 to 46. Jesus says, he literally says, you are cursed into the eternal fire for not, quote, doing unto the least of these. It's where he says, we ask, well, how did I do unto the least of these? Well, if I was, you fed the hungry and you took care of the thirsty and you clothed the naked and you, do the, you did that to the least of these, you were doing it unto me. And if you didn't do that, you're cursed into the eternal fire, according to Jesus. And then back to Romans. You'll see I'm kind of bouncing. You'll, you'll maybe connect the dots here. In Romans 9, I mean in Romans 8, we say that nothing can separate us from, the, from God. But turn the page to chapter 11. In chapter 11, verse 17... He's talking about how we are grafted into the, 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 the vine, the vine being the, the remnant of what it means to be the people of God. And those of us that are Gentiles get grafted in. That's the passage that we're in. And in chapter 17, he says, if some of the branches of that vine, right? So if some of the branches were broken off and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others... And now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree. That's a, a metaphor for salvation. Do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember, if you are, remember, it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. And then you will say branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. Well, that's true. They were broken off because of their unbelief. But you stand fast through faith, so do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Paul gets into the weeds on here for a second, talking about the natural branches, the Jewish people who are cut off from the shoot because of unbelief. And we're all like, yeah, and I got welded onto it, and I'm awesome. He's like, nah, hold your breath for a second. Don't get all full of yourself. They got cut off because of unbelief. Why do you think it would be any different for you? If all the promises coming from the Old Testament are made to the Hebrew people, and then Paul says in Romans that they get cut off because they chose not to believe the revelation of Jesus, would that be any different than you and me who are the wild olive shoots who were grafted on? Let me connect the dots for you, because we, we did all these pieces, and that's what your notes are for, right? To come back and connect the dots. This Baptist doctrine for us, what we would call once saved, always saved, it means that you can't fall out of salvation. You can't lose your salvation by accident, right? Like, oh, I tripped over something, and I said a bad word, and I crushed my head on the way down, and I died. Oh, sorry, shouldn't have said the bad word, right? That's what that means. You don't just fall out of your salvation. It also means that you can't be snatched out, that I'm in the hand of God, and Satan can't have me. I am protected for all of eternity. He's going to try, he's going to mess with me, but he can't pull me out. You can't be stolen by Satan. You can't be tripped into some form of hell, right? Like you are safe and protected. Protected, you can't lose it. And we'll say that again before somebody tries to be all David's getting all heretical, all right? You can't lose your salvation. But there's a consistent teaching here in Scripture that tells us that you can absolutely give it up. You can absolutely reject it or turn away from it. You can reject the salvation. You can be grafted on, Paul says in Romans, and then pull off because it's happened before. Go back to what he says in Hebrews. In verse 3, he says, How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? Now that word neglect there is it's actually an action. If you were to go if you were to try to read the, the whole sentence starting in verse two, the verb for that entire sentence is escape, right? But then it's connected to the participle, which is neglect, all right? And that's it. Those are the actions in the sentence. So remember your basic English. The action of the sentence is to escape, but you're escaping and neglecting, right? Those are the two points of action. So the word neglect is a verb, participle, participial form of a verb carrying the idea of action. The words for transgression 
and disobedience that were enough to get you kicked out in the Old Testament, right? Those are just nouns. Now keep up with our rabbinic preaching pr principle from lesser to greater. What's more important, the noun or the verbs? This idea of neglect carries action. It's more important than just a noun. It's more important than the other things that are happening in the sentence because the sentence is literally built around it. And we think about what it means to neglect. Like to neglect means to ignore, to not care enough to act. Neglect can mean to default on commitment. Think about how in a society we define child neglect. We actually use the phrase child abuse now, right? Because we've, we've, we've connected the two. But it used to, we were just called child neglect. But what is child neglect? It means to not care enough about the child to fulfill your commitment that you made to that child. Because that's what happens when we have kids, right? And that's one of the, the fiber problems that exist in our cultures. We've kind of lost sight of this. When you have a child or you adopt a child, what you're doing is you've made a commitment. I've made a commitment to my kids. I will love you. I will clothe you. I will feed you. I will educate you. I will give you the best possible chance to then live as an adult, right? I've made a commitment to that kid. I've also made a commitment to you. I've made a commitment to the culture around me. It's like, hey, I brought this kid into the world, and I'm going to provide for this kid until the kid can provide for itself. And you can see how our culture starts to break down when we stop, when we, we neglect that. We keep, keep, quit keeping those rules. But that's what child neglect is. It's to say, I've made a commitment to a child, and then I'm going to break it. I'm going to ignore it. I'm going to default on that commitment. I'm going to not care enough about this kid to do what I promised and what I'm supposed to do. I'm just going to ignore it. Neglect is an action. It's an active rejection of a priority. It's an active like rejection of a commitment to which you are accountable. I am accountable for my children. I'm accountable to them. I'm accountable to you, and I'm accountable to God for how I handle my kids, right? Now he uses the same idea to talk about my relationship to Jesus. Neglect is the active rejection of something to which I'm accountable. It's an action derived from apathy. It's the act of rejection. And drifting is the sign or the proof of purchase that neglect has happened. So step back and think about what he says. How do we escape whatever that punishment is, right? And he leaves it undefined. And I kind of wished he hadn't, but he did. How shall we escape whatever it is if we neglect such a great salvation? If we choose to not care enough about this great salvation. If we choose to just disavow our commitment to this great salvation. We choose to reject or to ignore this message of great salvation. If you care so little about the word of great salvation. If you care so little about Christ as the full revelation of God presented to you that you never read it or think about it or talk about it or share it with others, with others, that's neglect. That's me seeing something that I know is supposed to be important and I have decided I, I'm going to make you Lord of my life and you're going to be important to me and now I'm just, yeah, I just don't care that much. To the point that I never talk about it. I ignore it as if he's not even there. That's neglect. And what we're hearing from Hebrews in the first ever point for this sermon is that there are consequences for that. He doesn't tell us what they are, but we know that they exist. Let me summarize this for you, because if you're like me, my head hurts, right? Like my head is hurting. There's an awful lot happening in this dense couple of verses. So let me kind of pull all the pieces back together. He says, how do we escape if we neglect this salvation, if we neglect this message from Jesus? Neglect is rejection. It's an action on your behalf or on your part to hear, to know, to accept whatever it is, and then to, re and then to reject it. So that's what neglect is, to accept something 
and then reject it, to not care about it. That's way worse than disobedience, isn't it? I think about my relationship to my parents. I can disobey them, and I did an awful lot, right? They'd spank me, I'd usually apologize, and then we're fine the next day. But neglect or rejection is me packing a bag and leaving. I'm done with you. I'm never going to have anything to do with you again. That's way worse. It's way worse. So neglect is action built on apathy. To say, I see who Jesus is and I just don't care. And there's consequences for rejection. Now the central question is, how do we escape that? How do we avoid such neglect and escape the consequences that come from it? You go back to what he says at the beginning. Therefore, based on who Jesus is and how awesome Jesus is, pay closer attention to what you've heard. Pay closer attention to Jesus, to the revelation of God. Stay connected to that. Come back to Jesus often. Stay grounded in who Christ is. And think about all the other things that matter to you. And this is where like, you can see it dictating even the way that we, we run ourselves as a congregation. All the other things that matter for a church. All the things that matter to me as a Christian. All the things that matter to me as a pastor. What's the thing that needs to shine more than everything else? Jesus. What's the thing we need to come back to on a regular basis? Jesus. What's the thing you need to be talking about and thinking about and reading and focusing on? Jesus. What do you compare everything else to? Jesus. So I hear a new idea. Hey, what does Jesus say about that? I, oh, that's what Christians are supposed to act. Well, is that how Jesus acted? Oh, this is what it means to be holy and righteous and to be a good person. Well, is, is that what I hear and see from the life of Jesus? Because if he is the full revelation of God, there's nothing else. And that's how you stay grounded. So our author in his long-winded sermon gives us his very first point. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Everything else will be all right. Let's pray. Father, I ask that you would help us to keep our eyes focused on Christ. I know that's difficult. It's difficult for me because things are tempting and things are distracting. I get tempted by things that look or sound better and I get distracted by problems that I feel like I have to fix. And I know I hear it in the back of my mind every day. I hear Christ saying, just come back to me. Just talk about me. Just think about me. And I hear you saying that to us very clearly today. And I ask that you would help us with that. That each of us in our walk, our daily life, and the, the chaos that is our existence, that we would be focused on Jesus in all things. And that us as a church, as a family, with all the things that we need to do and care about and the stuff that requires our attention, that we would consistently and regularly come back to Jesus and how loving he is and caring he is and compassionate he is as the full revelation of who you are. Would you help us keep, keep Christ in the center? And we ask that in his name. Amen. We're going to close with a, a time of reflection, give you a couple of minutes to think about. I would encourage you, think about Jesus and how you can filter everything back to him. And if you need to talk to me about anything or do anything with, with me or the church, I'm going to stand in the back door and you can come talk to me in a moment if you need to. Uh, and then when we're done, Glenn will come and lead us in our benediction.